Good morning, everybody. It's Dr. Rebecca Griffith, the EDDPT, and this morning I am joined by Dr. Kaylee Brockway. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning, everybody. I am Dr. Kaylee Brockway, or Dr. B, the PT, and I'm excited to talk to you guys quite a bit today. Um, Dr. Griffith and I are going to talk about kind of the back and forth um, of the life of a home health therapist and the life of an ED therapist and how they kind of fit together. But before we like dive into that, you're a little bit of an emergency PT dabbler. Yeah, you have a little bit of experience. Just a little. Yeah, I think dabble is the right word for that. Um, at the hospital that I do inpatient rehab and acute care at, we also cover the ED, but our ED is, my, the majority is a psych ED. So we mostly see patients who are in withdrawal or detoxing mm -hmm. or, you know, significant mental illness and they need placement. Um, so we are kind of like the discharge planning team. Are they physically capable of going somewhere other than acute care or not? Um, and we decide how long they stay until they can go. Yeah, I think I've had this conversation with somebody else before that like one of the greatest travesties of our healthcare system is that you can't have a physical issue in addition to a mental health issue. Right. Because you can't go to mental health rehab if you require physical assistance or right. an assistive device. Mm -hmm. And you can't go to physical rehab really with a serious mental health concern. This is true. So those poor patients are kind of in that little purgatory area. So I appreciate the work that you do to help make sure those patients get where they need to go safely. And what's great about the hospital that I do this with is it's a county hospital. It's taxpayer funded. So if we need to keep that person for seven days because their mental health just isn't there and physically they can't go anywhere or either or we can keep them solely on one or the other or both because we just have that ability so that it's a really cool setting to be in. That's great. So. Tell me a little bit more about your background. I know, but I don't know that everybody else knows. You're a geriatric specialist, yes? I am. So yep. what does that look like? Um, so I have spent the last 10 years in kind of, uh, like you said, I'm a dabbler. So I've been in many different settings. I started in outpatient orthopedics and very quickly decided this is not for me. I have a sympathy problem. Um, I would rather help the people that can't breathe or walk than the people who can't throw a baseball, right? So I lean towards that side. It takes um, all types, right? It, it does. It does. We all have our own lane in this profession, which is so cool. I went um, back to outpatient for a little while. And I had a patient who said that they, they had one out of 10 back pain with golfing seven days in a row. And I thought, I can see how this is a problem for you. Um, but I miss my patients in the ICU yeah. who can't sit up. Right. And so that was that moment for me when I realized like, this is not the best fit for me. This person needs care. They deserve care. They're limited in what they can do and what they want to do. But mm, where I can make the biggest impact is not here. That's exactly it. Yeah, that's exactly it. So I went to outpatient neuro after that for a short stint. Love that. Um, then went to inpatient rehab for a short stint after that. Loved that too. And then I got a call from an old clinical instructor who was like, are you ready to come back yet? And it was to our home health agency uh, that I had done a clinical at. And I was like, yeah, I'm ready. So went back to the same place I did my clinical placement and worked there for seven years doing home health. And it was awesome. I got very involved in the heart and lung transplant team and uh, ended up doing the education for the hospital system and for the home health system on heart and lung transplant. It's awesome. But you know, when it comes to home health, you, you see the majority of people that you see can't leave the home because they have multiple complex chronic diseases. And that usually means usually that they're significantly older. Now we did have a pediatric division. Plenty of people are born with chronic diseases, but I didn't spend any time there. Got it. So your heart is with our older adult population. Definitely. Particularly our older adult population who are facing chronic disease. That's me. I love it. So let's start with a case because I, I think people need to understand what you do. Cause, cause obviously this podcast is, is sort of geared towards emergency department PTs. And I know what I send to home health and we'll talk about that a little bit later, <laughs> <laughs> but I want to know like what you typically see. So mm -hmm. I have some insight into what's happening. Sure. So I'll, I'll give you 
this case that is one that I use often with my students. I went to a home on a Sunday to do an evaluation for a patient who had just had a hip replacement. And I walk in and I see cups of water all over the house. And I just think, hmm, that's different. And as I'm talking with this wonderful woman, she's very short of breath. And I'm thinking, did you just get up and walk or something with your hip replacement? Her couch is real low. I know she's not, you know, in those precautions the way she should be. And she's like, no, you know, I've just been struggling to breathe, but my doctor just told me to drink a lot of water so that my hip heals. And so I'm just drinking a lot of water and I'm just doing what I can. And she was really trying, you know, like honestly, very, very much. She was trying. Had set herself up for what she thought was success. She thought that yes. So, you know, I'm, I'm cruising through her medical history and I see, take a wild guess, heart failure. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm thinking in my head, like, oh boy, we have way too much water on board and we have swelling. And so all of this fluid is in the wrong place. So I, I'm not quite sure she's bad enough to send in at this point. Cause I haven't gotten her up yet. So I do all my heart sounds, lung sounds. She's got crackles everywhere. Her heart's all over the place. And I, I know that it's not good. So I, I stand her up just to kind of get a feel like, how bad is this really? She walks 25 feet and is too short of breath to walk further and mm-hmm. has to sit down on a step. So <laughs> I know it's pretty bad now. Um, well, especially with but, a hip replacement, trying to get it back up off that step. That's not yeah, a winning combination right there. It wasn't, it wasn't, but we, we got her up and, you know, with hip precautions, I know that they're supposed to be the rule, but when it comes to people's houses, like you've got what you've got and you've got to do what you've got to do. So you now, try. That being said, there's a whole subset of patients that I see in the emergency department with dislocated hip replacements. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So and that's it, because it is not uncommon. That situation. <laughs> Cause I have outpatient PTs sometimes say to me, like people don't need the hip precautions. They never dislocate them. And that is not true. <laughs> so, that is not true. And those poor patients, especially, and I feel like once it's happened once, it will happen more. It often. will happen multiple times. I, yep. I actually have a frequent flyer who comes in every month or so after having dislocated the same hip. And, but then like, there's always a medical issue that, that per- yeah. keeps it. So she can't have a, you know, a stabilizing surgery. So yep. I am imagining your patient here. What did you do? <laughs> what did you decide? So the first step was call the cardiologist um, because her orthopedic surgeon does not care um, about anything other than her hip right now. And it's a Sunday. So I know I'm really not going to get the surgeon anyway. So I call the cardiologist on call. I just happened to get her cardiologist. So I got very lucky that he was on call that Sunday afternoon. He was amazing. He walked me through six medication changes to help manage this fluid overload. And I requested a nursing visit for that afternoon to make sure that, you know, I could get another set of eyes on her. Um, I called the nurse ahead of time and said, Hey, this is what you're walking into. I just want you to know you're probably going to have to send her in if she's not better in the next couple hours. Cause it's already pretty bad. So he called me after his visit with her and he had sent her in. Um, and she was admitted at that point through ED at, to the acute care hospital. And unfortunately this one has a sad ending. She didn't make it. No, I know. So, you know, we have to be careful with our words. Yes, we do need water to help ourselves heal, but we also have to make sure that we don't have too much water. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, gosh, and and that really highlights the need for physical therapists to be very clear on what people's medical comorbidities are before they make what seem to be like innocuous suggestions about people's health. Got it. Okay. My mentor, who is a critical care physical therapist, he and I have this saying that we, we use all the time, too much water and you could die, not enough water and you could die. Um, and we often treat patients who have advanced heart and lung disease. So yeah. it's, it's always such a delicate balance managing heart failure like that. Well, I tell you one time I had swimming induced pulmonary edema. Oh. Now, if you do a Google on that, like it's like Navy SEALs and triathletes, uh, <laughs> of which I am sort of a, have been a triathlete, but this was literally my first open water swim oh. ever in my entire life. So I just thought I was having a panic attack. Mm-hmm. Anyway, long story short, lungs totally filled with fluid. Like I thought, I thought I could just go home and go to bed, but a wiser person than me took me in. My my pulse ox was like 70%. Mm-hmm. And I ended up on BiPAP. 
And so I have this like huge empathy for people who are trying to breathe water. Yeah. Because it is real scary. It's very scary. And it feels real bad. Now swimming induced pulmonary edema, if you don't die, like it goes away very fast. Like Mm -hmm. oxygen for 24 hours. Like I literally was in the, in the hospital on a Friday, went to Wyoming for like the rodeo on Saturday afternoon, <laughs> like I was fine. So it had a good ending, but I still like get anxious when I go in the water. And every time I get a respiratory illness, I still get that little bit of like anxiety about it. So yeah. these poor patients, I can understand why they're afraid to move. I can understand why they don't want to drink water. Like, you know, I, I mean, yeah, it's scary. And, you know, a lot of what we do in home care is chronic disease management. So you have to know the specifics of every disease. And with heart failure, it's water. You have to manage the fluid, not too much, not too little, because either one, you'll end up in the hospital. And then you have to know all of the other parts of managing heart failure. So the rule of twos guidelines, you know, with our salt, our weight and our water, that's what it's all about. And it's a big team approach. We had lots of other team members in our home agency. Um, We had OT and dietary and nursing and social work, and we'd pull everybody in to make sure that these patients had what they needed to not end up back in the hospital. Mm -hmm. But you really have to know the specifics of each condition to make sure that that doesn't happen. So, I mean, obviously in this case, if the surgeon had not maybe encouraged his patient to drink a lot of water, what other things do you think could have been different or happened differently to help save this patient? Um, It would have been great if the first person who had gone into that home had recognized this problem. Um, I was not the first clinician who had Mm. gone into the home. The first one was actually the admitting nurse and it was earlier in the same day. Um, And I did call, yeah, I know. And I did call him and say like, hey, is this what you were seeing? And he said, yeah, that sounds about the same. Um, so it would have been great if we could have identified this earlier, gotten meds changed up earlier, you know, maybe even back to the ED earlier. Um, so we could have intervened sooner, but I think she was already on the way. Mobility issue. Like Mm -hmm. that the nurse just didn't really assess her mobility because at rest, did she look distressed? No, just a little heavy breathing, you know, didn't look in distress at all, was talking to me normally, but with fewer words per breath. Man, I was going PE that whole time when you were talking I know. about it. I was, that's where my head went. Well, you're just going to have to hold that thought until our last case. Shoot. Okay. All right. I'm ready. <laughs> all right. So part of the reason that I wanted to talk to you is because I like in the emergency department, my job is to get people out of the emergency department. That's my whole goal. So when I talk to students, I say, you know, like, you're not going to be the PT that gets this patient playing soccer. You're not going to be the PT that gets this patient back to all of their activities. Like, that's not your job. Your job is to get the patient out of the emergency department in the most patient-focused way possible. And to, do, nice. and to do as much for the patient and as little as possible to the patient. Right. Like, I don't want to, I don't want them to have to get injections. I don't want them to have to get x-rays, like as little as possible to get them in and out. And, and whether that's home or to inpatient rehab or admitted to the hospital, right. The whole name of this podcast is admitted or not. Like, how do we make that decision about how to get them from this hub, from this pivot point in their health journey to the next step, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest tools that I have is referring patients for home care. Yep. Partly because, especially during the pandemic, nobody wanted to go to rehab. Nope. And nobody wanted to come into the hospital. Nope. So I found myself even more relying on the home health therapists. Or like, or they're on the bubble, right? Like maybe you could go to outpatient, but it's a five week wait. Mm -hmm. And we just talked about that last week is, if without early access, what good is direct access, right? Right. So home health is a good example of early access that comes to the patient and is convenient. And and I was able to convince more patients to try home care during the pandemic because it was one person coming to them, not them being in a facility. Yes. It's definitely safer in the conditions of a respiratory virus for sure. For sure. And, and ideally, you know, people are taking precautions and things like that. Mm -hmm. And just the sheer number of COVID positive patients we had to send home 
Oh, yeah. With, so I think, again, home health therapists probably on the front line and really ignored during the pandemic as frontline providers for COVID positive patients. So high fives for that. But I want to know from you, like, what should I maybe not be sending to home health? But also ask your grace because oftentimes they don't have another choice. Yeah, no, I hear that. And I hear that a lot. And I've heard it a lot for a long time. Um, so things that shouldn't go to home health is when the patient can't be safe at home. Like that's the line and that's everybody (laughs) though. That's everybody. And that's the whole point. But the thing is like, if they have a caregiver present, even if it's temporarily who can make them safe at home, fine. Yeah. That's okay. Um, if they are in maybe, um, an adult foster care and that's a safe place for them to be because of the other people around, we can go see them there, even if it's temporary. Mm -hmm. Um, The Medi Lodge type placements, we can go see them there, even if it's temporary. So, you know, these, these folks who can't stay, but can't go, they, they kind of get stuck in this limbo because if we walk in to do that admission and they're not safe at home, We don't want to take responsibility for all the bad things that are going to happen. Weird. I know. Right. But we also can't because then if they get readmitted, that becomes our fault, but they shouldn't have been there to start with. Well, so apologies for that then, because I know there (laughs) there are several patients that I know it's not a good discharge plan. And I'll just admit that, but it's the only plan, whether that's yeah. because the patient is not agreeable to another plan or the patient yeah. doesn't like, like I'm thinking a lot about my Medicaid patient population specifically. Definitely. They can't go to subacute rehab and the, the process to go to long-term care is mm-hmm. extraordinarily difficult. And then if they can't go to acute rehab because mm-hmm. acute rehab facilities don't have enough Medicaid beds, or they've decided it's not acute rehab and no rehabable enough. Yep. Then I I mean, and then the other option is nothing. Yeah. Which is also not an option. So I imagine you as that person, like holding back the tide. It feels that way. Yeah. Because I can't keep it, the patient. And, And if it's, and obviously if it's like really a severe situation, we'll admit them to the hospital. Yeah. But oftentimes patients are not agreeable to that either. So Mm -hmm. I I don't, I just, I maximize as many home care services as I can. Mm -hmm. PT, OT, nurse, CNA, like whatever I can get for the patient. And I get them as much durable medical equipment as I can. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm sending these people to, these people to motels and hoping home care will magically come there. Yeah. We'll go see them there too. I will see people in parks if they're homeless. Really? Um, it does, oh, I yeah. I thought you had like, to have an address. So we we do have to have an address, but if that address just happens to be in a park, <laughs> I can still go see them there. Oh my yeah. gosh, I'm telling everyone. <laughs> um, it, I mean, don't get me wrong; it's not ideal, right? Right. But no. It, it's these people still need care, so we'll Absolutely. go. We'll go. Um, the, the caveat to what I said earlier too, about like, we can't keep them if they're not safe. If we can make them safe in one visit, like we teach them how to use all that equipment you ordered yes, and now they're safe. That's fine. Great. If we can make them safe enough to stay in one visit, there is one more workaround. So home care is Medicare part a or Medicaid, Mm -hmm. you know, hot inpatient. So it's hospital in the home under most payers, not all, but most. So technically under hospital in the home, um, if your patient comes home and they are receiving home care services for a few days and the nurse and PT and OT are like, this is not going to work. The social worker can then come in and work with the nurse and the PT or OT to have them admitted to subacute rehab from there. Great. That makes me feel a lot better yeah, because but- sometimes, sometimes <laughs> I think my patients, this may not sound right, but my patients need to go home and fail. Yeah. And, and, sometimes and I don't that's the want case. that for them. That's not what I want for them. Right. But sometimes they, they don't have the insight to realize in the moment in the emergency department, how significant the situation is, how yep. difficult their situation is going to be, what they're going to walk into when they get home. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, we had a patient once who, who we encouraged to stay, um, 
The patient did not want to do that. Mm -hmm. They got home with family, which, so like on, on the face of it, everything was okay. Like yeah. had 24 hour family support. We ordered DME. She got out of the car and her hip broke. Oh, so she, the patient was certain that her, her hip broke before she fell because oh. she stood, felt something crack heard and then went it, down and then fell. And so then she had to be admitted to the hospital with a hip fracture, but the yeah. patient just wasn't well, and we didn't want them to go, but on mm -hmm. the face of it again, like safe to go good discharge plan in place, respecting the patient's wishes, but it just didn't turn out well. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes there's just nothing you can do. And that's yeah. just what happens. I mean, even when in the short time that I was an outpatient, we had a patient that was coming in who she had had um, breast cancer, chemo, radiation, and had sustained a proximal humerus fracture on a fall. Okay. Not that atypical, but she was also going to our balance center and receiving vestibular services because she was having BPPV oh, wow. um, and that was being provided at a different center with a different therapist. So she came to our PT after their PT and just getting out of the car, she started spinning and went down right in our parking lot. And I mean, thankfully we all know how to get her up and take care of her, but there's just, sometimes there's just, you do what you can and things are going to happen anyway. And that's kind of like the motto of home care. <laughs> Well, so let me ask you this, and we can talk more about these patients with chronic disease issues, because I see so many patients that are coming in because those yep. chronic diseases are not managed and not understood. Yep. But what about these patients that I'm sending to you that have like <clears throat> really bad back pain, for example? Yeah. Oh like yeah, I'll I, take cause, those. Because I'm discharging patients who, it might've taken me two hours to get the patient to be able to stand up mm -hmm. because of the amount of pain that they're having. And outpatient isn't realistic because they can't nope. get there and it's five weeks out or even three days in some cases, or they live alone and they, they just cannot. Yeah. Um, is that okay? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll totally take those. Mm. So homebound criteria, like if they're in too much pain to safely leave the home, absolutely they're homebound. I'm like, if you, you can't walk 50 feet, let yeah. alone get in your car. Yeah, no, no, no. And they should be seen in home care for that because if they do then try to leave, they're probably going to get hurt because they're going to go down and fall and you're going to get other injuries. So yeah, no, we'll absolutely take them in home health. A lot of the home health therapists I worked with were McKenzie trained. I also practice oh, really? under that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. I also practice under that framework. And a lot of them were also OMPT, you know, manual therapy trained. So plenty of home health therapists have all of those advanced trainings. There's a lot of board certified specialists in home health, um, in a lot of different areas. So yeah, we'll take them. All right. Well, that, that I think you need to maybe take a beat and clear up some common misconceptions about home health PT. There's a lot. Because there's a lot. There's and, a lot. And I, I mean, the most common ones that I hear, I'm not saying I believe any of these because I don't. I, I've done a <laughs> clinical in home health. It's not for me. I'm not strong enough human for that. But I hear a lot of, this is where people go to die in their career. I hear a lot of things from patients like they just give me these exercises on a paper and every therapist I see gives me the same exercises and then they just watch me do it you know I hear things like um these are the PTs who aren't APTA members these are the PTs who who don't really engage with their profession and are just kind of over it but that's not the impression I've been getting from home health therapists like yourself. And like, I'm in a fellowship program right now. There are home health therapists in the fellowship. And I've always just been impressed with the home health therapists that I meet. But can you kind of speak to that a little bit? Because obviously that's not the case. It's not the case. And I'll show my shirt that I'm wearing. <laughs> we are APTA members. Um, so obviously, you know, just like with, with any profession, you have the really good clinicians, the middle clinicians, and the not so great clinicians. Like that's, that's everywhere. It's every profession. 
I can say all of those things that you said about outpatient therapists. I mean, well, they just, and let's be real. There's so many about <laughs> acute PTs, right? Well, like, right, that they we just, just walk, walk people. Patients. Yeah, they totally. just so walk people. That's why I think all of these stereotypes are garbage, but I want to give oh, yeah. you the, I want to give you the moment to like debunk this. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, specific to the company that I work for, we had a board certified vestibular specialist. We had two NCSs, the neurological certified specialist. We had three geriatric certified specialists and two um, orthopedic certified specialists. We had a lot of board certified specialists and we had a team of 86 between PT, OT and speech. So we, we had a lot of highly specialized people. We had OTs who had umpteen certifications in brain injury rehab. We had speech therapists who were doing in-home swallow studies and all kinds of scopes in the home. And it was amazing. Um, I think that you'll, you're definitely going to find some of those cases where you have the, the PTs who are burned out and they're having to see um, you know, eight visits in a day, which for home health is a lot, because if you think about it, you have to drive between houses. If these houses are far apart, that takes a long time. Um, our documentation, as everybody knows, is extensive. It's far more than many right. other settings. Oh, I remember uh, that. It was my first yeah. physical rotation. And I was like, I don't think I can be a physical therapist. Yeah. Um, and, you know, on a start of care visit, an Oasis visit, if it's done properly, it takes three hours. And Ew. sometimes, yeah, I know. Well, it's, it's hospital in the home, right? So I you take, have to do, ew. Ew, right. So you have to do everything that that patient would get in a hospital admission in their home. That means a full top to bottom wow. skin check. You have to walk them around their house. You have to see them get dressed and undressed. You have to do the whole thing. Wow. If you're doing it right. So to try to stack a lot of visits in one day, any more than like five or six is really a lot unless you're doing a 10 hour day. So there are definitely home health therapists that get the rap because they're trying to do too much or their pro productivity requirements are too high in their company. So yeah, that's totally out there. Absolutely it is. But if you think about the people that we see, we're seeing the people who can't even get to anywhere else because they're too debilitated. They're too sick. They can't bring their ventilator with them because it's plugged into the wall at home. Yeah. Um, you know, these, these people are on life vests, cardiac support devices, LVADs, um, sometimes RVADs, LVADs, and they have hemodialysis. Those are some of my favorites. Um, these people uh, require a seriously advanced knowledge base to yes. properly manage them. And a lot of times you don't hear of anything else from uh, the home health therapist because we're managing those people successfully at home. We're not sending them back to you. We're keeping them safe at home. So you're really only hearing the bad stuff because that's the stuff that's leaving the house. Fair. Fair enough. I think also it seems to me like you're a little bit of, have to be a little bit of an emergency physical therapist, not an ED PT, right? But an emergency physical therapist, because yeah. like, I remember as a student, I came into a house and my patient was sitting at the table and my job first year PT student was to try and take their vitals with the pull socks, the portable pull socks and like a manual pulse. Like yes. that was the assignment and I did it. And the patient's pulse was like 210. Yeah, that sounds about sitting right. there. Yeah. And I said, clinical instructor, their pulse is 210. And she said, I'm sure you're doing it wrong. <laughs> because I probably would say that too. I'd be like, yeah, well, I like, let's like double check that. Because I was, like I said, first clinical, second mm -hmm. semester of PT school, no idea. And she checked it and she was like, oh, well, it's like 225. And I was like, mm. like, and I had no idea what to do. Yeah. And, well, and in the end, we did send, we did several things. We did more thorough vitals um, from that perspective, because we were going to do that anyway. But then like a blood sugar check, a medication mm -hmm. review, like a thorough history of what the patient had been doing before we got there. Yep. His blood sugar was like 640. Yeah. So we sent that patient to, to the hospital, but I think as, as an emergency PT going into a home, you have to be prepared to call 911. You have to be prepared to manage a crisis on your own. Yes. I've had emergency PTs find their patients down. Yes. And I'm calling you an emergency PT because I think you're a frontline provider. Thank you. 
we're first receivers, but you guys are like first responders in several cases. Ideally not, right? Like ideally there's no yeah. emergency component to your job. Yeah, ideally, but you know, the majority of times there's at least some crisis management in most yeah. visits. Yeah. So right? like, like, I, like I said, I know what I'm sending you. Right, exactly. Um, so like, like I was telling you, my differential diagnosis process for my patients is very different than other settings. So like when I walk into that home, my first step of differential is, is my patient going to die today? It's not, why is their shoulder hurting? It's not, is this a tissue issue or something else? You know, it's, is my patient going to die in my care in the next hour? The second step of that is, is that the plan? Because we also do hospice. Yeah. So it maybe that's the plan and that's going to happen on my time. And I have to be ready to, you know, be there for that event. And that could be any hospice patient I walk into. Um, well, I mean, what a gift though. It is. In the it last, is. in the last, um, years of the pandemic, I have, I have helped three people kind yeah. of transition. Yeah. And one of those was a family member and I helped provide hospice care. And then two of them were mothers of friends mm. that I came and I helped support that transition. What a gift as a physical therapist to be able to use your skills to help mm-hmm. people as they yeah. transition. And a lot of people don't even know that physical therapists work in hospice and palliative care. I wish care. we did more. I, I know. Um, there's a really great book that just came out by Chris Wilson and Amy Litterini on physical therapists providing palliative and hospice care. It is all specific to that. So I'd highly recommend if that's what you're interested in that you check out that book. Um, but you know, if, if it is not the plan that the patient is supposed to die in my care that day, um, then I also have to, my next step is, so what am I going to do about it? Yeah. If they're going to, if they're going to die with me today and they're not supposed to die with me today, what can I do about it? <laughs> I mean, and some, and sometimes there's a lot that I can do about it. Yeah. Um, I, and sometimes like I can do all of that myself and keep them safe at home and it's not a problem. And sometimes I can't do it myself and I need to call for help. I need to call the physician for some orders, or I need to make the 911 call. Or I, like my students like to say, you got to call the bus and get them a ride, um, to go see Dr. Griffith. Yeah, man. So I do take some patients in from home health therapists and almost always it's for good reason. Yeah. Um, however, sometimes it's not, Mm -hmm. and I wonder what I'm missing. And so I think sometimes if we had better communication between like the home health therapist and the therapist or, and and we get, we get patients from outpatient PTs as well. Oh yeah. But there's, I am thinking of a specific case with a patient who was sent into the emergency department by their home health therapist weekly for a long period of time because the patient had hypotension hypotension yes which i can appreciate that when you Mm -hmm. see those numbers it can be a little alarming Mm -hmm. but that's also that patient's baseline and the patient didn't want to go against the pt Mm -hmm. but i felt like in that case like maybe the decision making wasn't being made as a team yeah. And it was just being made based on like arbitrary cutoff numbers that we learn in school. Yeah. Yeah. And arbitrary cutoff numbers are a problem, especially with blood pressure, right? Especially because hypertension. That's what I get yeah. from outpatient PT. Oh, yeah. Hypertension, hypertension, hypertension. Yeah. And I know we're taught to send those patients to the emergency room. When they come here, the first thing we say is, Did you take your blood pressure medication today? Oh, no, I don't think <laughs> oh, I did. No. Oh, okay. Well, maybe like, like, like let's give that to yeah. you and send you home. Um, but usually the, the physician, <laughs> like, why is this patient here? And I'm like, yeah. they're like, the physical therapist sent them here. Can you explain that? And I'm like, well, <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> but no, I love that. They put that on you. I know. <laughs> like you're well, one of them. Why would a physical therapist send the patient? Well, I'm like, well, because we're taught in school that this is a scary thing. But what I've learned in the emergency department is that it's not scary to them. Not no, Mm -mm. no. And you know, especially with someone who has hypotension, what they may be seeing in the home is that like they're trying to get the patient up and walk them to the bathroom. And by the time they hit the toilet, 
their blood pressure's tanking well, and, we're and they're checking passing all out. That. We're checking all of that, <laughs> yeah. right? Like yeah. I, I check orthostatics on any Everybody. patient that is yeah. coming in for a fall because, you know, it's a huge part of the workup that I think gets missed. I check oh, yeah. vitals with mobility. Like that's a huge part of what we do. Mm-hmm. And this patient for me, like by this point, this is like the sixth time I have seen this patient. <laughs> She's a like stable 80 over 45 kind of gal. I don't, you know, mm-hmm. so yeah. But what do you wish we knew before we sent patients home to home health? So there's a whole set of red flags in home health that don't exist anywhere else. Um, Yeah. So like if a patient is not safe at home because their home is not safe. So there might, there might be people in and out of the home that make that home unsafe. Yes. Um, There might be construction issues in that home that make Mm -hmm. that home unsafe or infestation issues. Um, It might be a hoarding environment that makes that home unsafe. So like there's a whole set of red flags where we can't leave them there. Like literally it is like on our license that if we leave them there, it is neglect. So we have to send them somewhere. And the only people that can take them right away is you. Yes. And, and I appreciate that. Paramedics give us huge details of what's going on in the home. Sometimes they document with photographs, things like yes. that. I've had we do several as well. patients coming out of hoarding situations or situations where the paramedics photograph the patient on the ground while family is like eating in the background yep. kind of thing. Um, but my question for you about that is, <sighs> that's a barrier for so many patients to receive home health. It is because I'll have patients refuse that assistance because they know yep. that their hoarding situation will call cause problems. Mm-hmm. And they know that they have bed bugs and they know yep. that it's not safe. And so they keep coming back to the emergency department and can't get the care they need at home. Mm-hmm. So who helps them with that? So that has to be a social work issue. And from the home health perspective, like we can go in there and look at the chart and say like, okay, they've been to ED for this. We've done our part. We've gotten them out. They're now back. So what can we do now? Um, So usually it's, you know, we got to get social work on the phone for some community resources to get all that stuff in there. And home health is often like the connector between the patient and the community resources if there's like a good knowledgeable social worker on the case. Um, we, we had in the company that I worked for, we had a foundation as well that did a lot of um, paying for services for patients. So we would get people's pets taken care of. We would get their home bombed for insects. We would do all kinds of things, but get them ramps built so that they could get in and out when yeah. their stairs were broken. So we had that capability. Not every agency does obviously, but there are community foundations that have those abilities. You just have to get connected. So as long as we've shown that we've done our due diligence, we've sent them we've tried to not let them be neglected but they're back home now we can try other things but it just takes a really coordinated effort Hmm. yeah yeah and that's so hard to find that consistency and that coordination of care yeah we were very lucky in that my agency was owned by a large hospital system so we had we had the full chart access. We could call up the inpatient rehab doctor they saw for three weeks, mm. six months ago, you know, and we, we could email the nurse that took care of them in acute care. So we had all of that communication ability and that really made all the difference. Yeah. Um, but the other the other red flag that is in home care that you really don't see in a lot of other settings is the med errors. And I know oh, that you see that all yeah. the time, right? Because so, patients are coming in because of that. Yes, and and I, I literally send sending them. <laughs> well, and I send nurses and occupational therapists to go to the home yeah. to help fix those issues. Yeah. So, so tell me about that. Yeah. So we cannot go in long term just to help people set up their meds. Like we can show them how to do it. We can teach them how to do it. We can make sure that they can do it, and that mm-hmm. can take a few weeks. But eventually, they either have to be able to do it on their own, or they have to have a trained caregiver do it. So our job is to teach them, right? It's not to keep them forever. Just like an emergency, your goal is to get them out. Our goal is to keep them there, but we get out. Right. (laughs) So the goal is the same. It just goes the other way. But oh my goodness, the med errors. And as PTs, you know, 
we are fully responsible for primary medication management in home health care. Medicare has deemed us fully capable of doing that. We have the education to do that. We should be doing that in every setting, in my personal opinion. But home health is really where you see it because you have to sit down with all the bottles. You have to enter everything in the chart. You have to see every med. You have to put it all in. You have to do the education and you have to make sure they can take it. Just as yeah, the PT. I don't think a lot of PTs know that. Yeah, I don't think so either. But that's, you know, there's a reason that I'm the pharmacology instructor at our university. <laughs> it's because I have that background. Um, yeah. And our, our system that we had was great. You know, it would tell us like, you've entered these 67 medications. Here's all your interactions. Here's the three red flags you need to call the doctor about. So nice. we would get the changes made in the home so that they wouldn't have to go to you. But there's always those situations where, you know, Mr. Smith took Mrs. Smith's pills today and they have very different diagnoses yes. about their boxes mixed up. So those are where we will send people in um, because we can't fix that in the home. Mm -hmm. We have no idea what the other person is taking because they're not our patient. Right. Um, we have no idea what the side effects of all of that polypharmacy between the two sets of drugs is going to cause. So we just send them because they need to be monitored. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, there's so many other med errors with old drugs that people have had in their houses forever and just take as needed, mm -hmm. which as needed could be for years. Um, I've seen quite a few overdoses in the home that I've had to be that first responder to and, you know, get them into you guys as fast as we can so that we can get Narcan on board. Cause we, we didn't carry it at the time. However, many now? Home health um, not now, no, but many home health companies are starting to, um, yeah, there's which the I think is great. position statement that there is. a Narcan should be available anywhere physical therapy occurs. That's exactly right. And it should be because we're seeing the people who are on all the opioids. So right. we need to have that available. I completely agree. And there's an awesome, for anybody listening, awesome training and tutorial online from Stephen Kinney about yes. how to utilize Narcan. And so, how to get it and if, how you're, to if get you're a it. provider. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So no excuse. Like, let's all, let's all do that. Yeah. And don't Obviously forget, we have Samaritan it in the emergency laws. department, but yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, some people are more sensitive to those drugs than others and they get a knee replacement. We see a lot of joint replacement in home care that mm -hmm. first five days afterward, you know, is real shaky. So, you know, they get that knee replacement. All of a sudden they're on three opioids that they weren't on before. And then they've got, you know, tramadol in addition and some other drugs in addition. And they start getting a little wonky and we got to be there to help increase them fall risk. Oh, big time. Yeah. Big time. And you know, if they're already on an SSRI and then the doctor gives them tramadol, now we have a seizure risk too. So yeah. On, yeah. So lots of med errors in the home. We send them to you when they're the bad ones, but a lot of them we can manage. I see a lot of wound care issues as well. Things that oh, yeah. kind of aren't being cared for properly at home um, or have kind of spread and gotten out of control, those types yeah. of things. That's, that's one of the beauties of being a home health therapist is like all four pillars of PT, you do all of it. And hey, you might I'm claiming that as what the emergency department of PT, you're not but we're, to also do that. But you're an emergency provider and you just said, I'm an emergency provider, right? So, so. Uh, perfect. <laughs> perfect. It's it. really just more about we're PTs and it's our job because it's within our scope. So if it exists, we better treat it. Agree. Okay. All right. So I think we have time for one more case. All right. So hit me. And then I'm going to tell you, if you sent this person to the emergency department, I'm going to tell you what I would do once they get there. Okay. Great. And then we'll decide, admit it or not. Do you, want, do you want to talk about the rancher farmer sign first? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we can do I that real quick. I live in Colorado. Quick. I, well, I, I know I live in Texas, so I have the rancher sign here, but I used to live in Michigan. So it was the farmer sign. Oh yeah. Well, we have both because <laughs> we have the plains, but we also have serious cow. Yeah. What do you oh, call yeah. this? Like serious cow capital in Colorado. Yes. Yes. So what we're really referring to is that if someone who is a rancher or farmer comes into the emergency department, odds are something is very seriously wrong and their because, wife made them come and their wife made them come because these folks will not leave their property mm -hmm. if they do not absolutely have to. Right. And it's really great when they drive themselves, when they've like cut off their arm, but they drove yeah. themselves to the hospital because they will. Yeah. yeah. Cause it's an inconvenience and they need it to get is. it taken care of so they can yep. get back to work. I had a, a rancher with a heart replacement. Oh yeah. Who like a heart replacement, heart transplant, who was like, I'm ready to discharge. I'm like, it, 
like you yeah. you just came out of the or last night doesn't like, matter it's not quite like it's just not it's not time yet so <laughs> so yeah. i get it okay so i'm ready are we having a rancher farmer case um no we're not gonna have a rancher farmer i was gonna case, say I the just, answer I just is to, to get the code that. cart yeah oh yeah it's code cart it's like order the most advanced image you can possibly think and of and all of the blood panels like you yes. have to get everything no i was i had a i had a farmer once who he had just had open heart quadruple bypass and i was seeing him like three days later for the home eval you know and he was like i don't need pt and i was like oh okay. He's like, I just got back from breakfast with my friends. We're going out to the farm later. We have some harvesting to do. I don't need PT. <laughs> it's like, you are, you're still like open. <laughs> like, there's so much more to this. And no, didn't want PT. No, I, I mean, it's otherwise. very, I mean, it's very simple for them. Like yeah. they, they have their priorities and mm-hmm. I've but got odds are it's that. bad. And they're like, when I have a pain scale, like my is this like a rancher level 10? It's a whole different scale. It's a different scale. Yeah. On it's the, like on the, my open heart guy, no pain. He just oh. had his chest split open. No, no but pain. Like, I usually get, well, that doesn't matter, ma'am. <laughs> that okay. sounds right. Well, it mattered to me. I'm glad to know it doesn't matter to you, but okay. Yeah. But anyway, we can go on to our last case. I, just, right, I just love talking about the rancher farmer I know. Well, side because gosh, it's toughest humans on earth. Salt of the they earth, are. kindest patients, most oh, yeah. respectful. Yep. I, I would like, if I could open a uh, care practice for ranchers and farmers only, I would, but nobody would come. I wouldn't no, make they wouldn't. <laughs> you wouldn't make zero money. And, <laughs> and they would be if just they actually showed up. You'd just be sending them all to the emergency department. <laughs> but they'd show up and they'd stop by for coffee and they would probably they bring would. me some vegetables and they a would. cow. Yep. And I would do nothing for them is how that would happen. So, but it would be lovely. It would be delightful. Yeah. <laughs> I'm from a one stoplight town on the plains of Colorado and there are not better people anywhere. So there aren't. it's true. All right. Hit me. I'm ready. Okay. So, um, cervical fusion, three level, seeing in the home, third visit, walk in, we've known this guy for a little bit now. And he's sitting on the couch and telling me he can't get his brother on the phone. And I'm like, all right, why not? Well, I can't read the numbers on the phone. Mm. And I'm thinking, "Mm, why is that? Has something happened to you today? Yeah, I took a shower and I slipped and fell in the bathroom. No. Were you wearing your shower collar when you did this? What shower collar? Mm. Okay. So I'm going to call your brother on your phone what's his number i don't know okay so thankfully i'm like going through the contact old old school phone going through the contact list find the brother thankfully you knew his name called his brother hey i'm here with your brother he seems a bit confused can you talk to him for a minute and tell me if he's himself brother's like that doesn't even sound like my brother i'm not sure what's going on right now Mm. okay so Do you want to take a guess or do you want me to tell you my first step? Um, I'm going to guess you did a neuro screen. Sure did. Sure did. Um, Surprisingly, other than his pre-existing things, it came back pretty clear other than the confusion. Now, did he have a vision deficit or was he just confused? Just very confused. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I would probably refer him to the emergency department for a head CT that's a really good idea so I, <laughs> I, I i called 911 and unfortunately we were like you know your little one stop light town in the colorado plains we were out in that kind of area so it was a two yeah. hour wait for an ambulance yikes so the first responders show up and they're like the local fire dudes and they know this guy right and so they're like you know he just took too many pain meds right and i was like no, that's not what this is. And they were like, no, it is. He just took too many pain meds, but they don't offer to Narcan him at all. And I'm over in the kitchen counting the pain meds thinking, no, I like, I can mathematically figure out how many he took because I can see what was on the bottle. He's taken three in three days. He did not take too many. Well, and if he, if he hadn't fallen, like I would give maybe that a little bit more credence, but right. Yeah. So they told me that because it was going to be a two hour wait and they think he just took too many pain meds, he would probably be fine and didn't need to go. I had to, and he lives alone and he lives alone out in the middle of nowhere. It's a hard pass. I had to pull the doctor card 
Mm. Like I am a doctor here and I am telling you that you need to take him. So they did. Any further guesses? Subdural. Oh, this one's always a surprise. I love it. <laughs> so he went, well, right? He went, he went. Yep, they took him. And I, I pulled the chart a little bit later in the day. Three PEs. Really? Really. So the fall was caused by the problem. Got it. it. didn't cause the problem. Yeah, I had a patient with COVID who had a similar issue um, because yeah. of the PEs related to COVID. She went down in the shower yeah. But she wasn't found for several days down in the shower and she fell over. Mm. Anyway, I, I think in the end she was okay. Um, mm. by the, yeah. some miracle. Um, yeah, but yeah. Yeah. So He's this lucky guy, he didn't die. I know. Um, I just happened to show up on shower day. Thank goodness. Um, but yeah, so he, he was admitted, go figure a few admitted days worth of heparin. Sure. Yeah. Admitted for sure. A few days worth of heparin. He came home. He did great. Um, the rest of his rehab was totally uneventful and he is fine. Love it. He lived to tell the tale. Yeah. Not that he remembered much of it, but you know, the weird thing about it was, of course I did vitals, right? Not Mm -hmm. hypertensive. The heart rate was a little bit elevated, but he had just fallen and crawled himself to a couch. So like not terribly surprising respirations were not abnormal and uh, pulse ox was not abnormal. It was the confusion the altered mental status. And that, that's what I had to, you know, put down as why I sent him was altered mental status. Yeah, man, I thought I was going to be right. I know. Nope. Three PEs. So just, you know, post understanding post-surgical complication risks, the timeframes that those happen in, he had a three level cervical fusion. He's at risk. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Huh? Yeah. So that's one where I had to be that first responder and then had to pull the D card. (laughs) Well, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. All right. So I think that we probably need to have another podcast about geriatric considerations for our homebound patients and things that we need to look out for. But I appreciate you being with us today on Admit It or Not and for sharing what you do with us. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.